Chapter 3 Max glanced at her watch. It was only 6.17 a.m. She, unlike Mr. Kennedy, was an early riser. Always had been, probably always would be. The morning, especially that quiet space between dreaming and total wakefulness, was when most of her massive ideas floated through her drowsy brain. The ideas helped tamp down the sadness that could come in those same quiet times. A sadness that all orphans probably shared. Made more intense because Max had no idea who either of her parents were. Max creaked her way back up the hall to her room as quietly as she could. She could hear Mr. Kennedy already snoring behind her. Max had decorated her own sleeping space in the stables building the same way she had decorated all the rooms she had ever temporarily lived in. By propping open her battered old suitcase on its side to turn it into a display case for all things Albert Einstein. Books by and about the famous scientists were lined along the bottom like a bookshelf. Both lids were filled with their collection of Einstein photographs and quotes. She even had an Einstein bobblehead doll that she'd found once upon a time in a museum store dumpster. She used it as a bookend. Max couldn't remember where the suitcase came from. She just always had it. It was older than her rumpled knit sweater, and that thing was an antique. The Otis photograph in her collection, the one that someone other than Max, she didn't know who, had pasted inside the suitcase lid so long ago that its edges were curling, showed the great professor lost in thought. He had a bushy mustache and long, unkempt hair. His hands were clasped together, almost as if in prayer. His eyes were gazing up toward infinity. That photograph was Max's oldest memory. And since she never knew her own parents at an early age, Max found herself talking to the kind, grandfatherly man at bedtime. He was a very good listener. She became curious as to who the mystery man might be, and that's how her lifelong infatuation with all things Einstein began. Like how he was born in Germany, but he had to leave his home before the Second World War. And how he was so busy thinking of big, amazing ideas, he sometimes forgot to pay attention to his job at the patent office. They had a lot in common. <clears throat> Next to the photograph was Max's absolute favorite Einstein quote. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Unless, of course, you don't have the money to make the things you dream up come true, Max muttered. Mr. Kennedy was right. She couldn't afford to build her green gas mill, and she couldn't ask Mr. Sammy Monk for his horse manure or anything else because Mr. Sammy Monk couldn't know anybody was living in the abandoned floors above his horse stable. She'd just have to imagine a different solution to the squatter's heating dilemma, one that didn't cost a dime and could be created out of someone else's discarded scraps. Max turned to her computer, which she had built herself from found parts. It was amazing what some people in New York City tossed to the curb on garbage pickup days. Max had been able to solder together, which with a perfectly good soldering iron someone had thrown out, enough discarded circuit boards, unwanted wiring, abandoned processors, rejected keyboards, and one slightly blemished retina screen from a cast off MacBook, MacBook Pro to create a machine that whirred even faster than her mind. She also had free Wi-Fi thanks to the Link NYC public hotspot system. She could even recharge her computer's batteries, discovered abandoned behind one of the city's glossy Apple stores at the kiosk just down the block from the stables. Reliable Wi-Fi was one of the main reasons that Max had selected her current accommodations. Easy access to a type flight school was the other. Max clicked open a browser and went back to the internet page that she had bookmarked the night before. It was a nightmarish news report about children as young as seven working in perilous conditions in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to mine cobalt that ends up in smartphones, cars, and computers sold to millions across the world. The children, as many as 40,000, were being paid $1 a day to do backbreaking work. They were also helping make a shadowy international business consortium called the Corp very, very, very rich. The story broke Max's heart because Max's heart, like her hero Dr. Einstein's, was huge.